Hi, everyone. I'm Yanni Valtruller. I'm a researcher at the MIT Media Lab. And uh, over the past decade, I've been studying the topic of uh, scalable AI, which is basically how can artificial intelligence be used and deployed, not in niche use cases, but in a transformative manner, uh, in a high throughput um, way. Um, we've all heard that data is the new oil and um, government agencies and companies all around the world invest tremendous amounts of uh, energies and resources collecting and gathering data, building data lakes, training teams of data scientists to handle this data. But at the end of the day, what we discover is that um, in most cases, uh, a large portion of this data remains untouched, which causes a significant um, uh, spending of resources um, basically for nothing. Now, in order to understand why, we need to remember that data comes in two shapes and forms. One is what we know as static features. This is everything that has to do with age, um, gender, ethnicity, salary, all of the things that um, usually don't change or uh, change very slowly. These features are very friendly for machine learning models, for artificial intelligence techniques. Um, however, unfortunately, these are just um, the significant smaller uh, portion of data that we collect. All of the um, transactional data, everything that has to do with text, with voice, with video, with behavioral data, all of this is highly dynamic in nature. However, it is much more influential over uh, individuals' behaviors than the static features, as uh, many studies have shown uh, recently. Um, and um, when I'm talking about dynamic um, features or properties, I refer to health, life-changing events like uh, people getting married, stress, um, members of the family who just got COVID, things that happen in work. All of these things take part for short periods of time and then they disappear, but um, they significantly influence what uh, individuals are prone to do or not do. And they are very difficult to um, detect with traditional machine learning um, tools, unless we know what we're looking for. And um, this brings us back to the niche use cases. Um, so all of these dynamic features, dynamic properties of human behavior, basically is what prevents us from deploying AI and machine learning at scale. In order to mitigate this problem, we spent several years uh, working at MIT under the supervision of a renowned MIT professor Alex Pentland on looking at data using a different perspective. And what we discovered was that there is a set of mathematical invariances, mathematical um, laws of nature, if you will, that govern the way human data behaves. Basically, what, it's, what this means is that every data that we collect, and it doesn't mean if these are credit card, uh, purchases or data gathered from transportation systems or social media, every such data must contain within it this um, set of uh, mathematical and statistical properties. They, they emerge in any such, uh, such um, uh, database um, automatically. And we call this um, uh, theory social physics. Basically what this enables is switching the way we approach data. Instead of developing a model for every specific problem, which is very expensive and slow and also impractical in many cases, as we will shortly see, we can build a single model, a single model that uh, describes all of the data and then ask this model different question. And this, um, uh, uh, this novel uh, way of um, looking at data um, enables us for the first time to take data from human uh, behavior and process it automatically. We can build uh, basically a filter, a filter that um, can sift 
streams of human data, streams of data we know nothing about. The data can even be encrypted, it can be noisy, we don't need to clean the data. And this filter can let all of this data pass through it, but detect automatically anomalies. Um, chunks of data, if you will, that infringe the social physics invariances. And these anomalies, they basically indicate um, patterns or uh, behavioral commonalities within the data that um, can be used in order to find communities, in order to detect um, changes in uh, groups' uh, behavior uh, in the near future, and so on. And all of this is done automatically. Now, because we, this, this uh, methodology can be applied to different types of data, it can also be used in order to achieve an additional very coveted goal. And this is federated learning. Federated learning is what happens when we have several organizations or several uh, players, um, uh, each having a completely different type of data. Uh, and they want to collaborate, but they are uh, not interested or in many cases forbidden from actually sharing the data. Um, we can even assume that they are uh, forbidden from sharing not just the raw data, but also their questions. So how do we let different entities, um, each uh, of which uh, possesses different type of data and different questions in mind, to collaborate and benefit from this collaboration without infringing um, the, the, the rules that uh, the regulator, for example, uh, decides on uh, regarding uh, privacy or data sharing. And the answer is that we can use social physics in order to create um, a learning uh, federation. Uh, basically, every data resides where it's located. Nothing leaves the premise that uh, uh, is located at. But the derivatives of the data, these um, correlated anomalies, these uh, meta patterns that social physics can detect, they are being shared. They do not contain any um, uh, raw data or any features or any behavioral or any identifiable uh, piece of information, but they can still be used in order to augment the predictive capability of all the members of this federation. And an example can be, for example, um, uh, a large conglomerate that has a banking division, a mobile division, uh, insurance, commerce, and they all want to collaborate, but um, uh, without sharing the data because this is forbidden by law. Using this approach, the bank, for example, can better serve their customers using derivative information that originate from the mobile division without any mobile data, or any direct um, identifiable information from the mobile data ever leaving um, the mobile uh, company or the mobile uh, division. Uh, let's look at two concrete examples. Um, what you see here is the work that we've done on uh, COVID-19 when it just erupted. Well, when I'm giving this lecture now, it's with us for already a good couple of years and, and we all hope it will go away. But um, when it just started, what uh, researchers um, uh, were baffled by was that all the models that they have um, simply didn't work because everything changed. People start, st stopped leaving their houses and they started engaging in very different kinds of behaviors that no existing model was able uh, to comprehend. And um, the question was, how can we predict where COVID is going to erupt, in which neighborhoods COVID uh, is going to erupt so we can um, uh, uh, enact some uh, intelligent lockdown uh, instead of locking up uh, the entire country. And we were given access to all the mobile data from the US, uh, anonymized, uh, given to us on a census block uh, basis. Um, basically, we knew um, for each uh, small neighborhood how many uh, mobile devices are visiting which other small neighborhood in the US. And using this data, we applied social physics in order to find behavioral commonalities. And this enabled us to automatically 
predict which regions in the country are about to display an eruption of COVID. And this was done using uh, the automatic ad hoc detection of behavioral commonalities between regions in the countries. Now, we didn't have to define these features that we were looking for because we didn't know what they were. Nobody knew. We instead um, enabled um, this um, or used this methodology in order to automatically find these behavioral correlations. And um, we published these results that uh, demonstrated the ability to focus the efforts on a much smaller part of the, uh, the country instead of just uh, uh, spreading it on all the neighborhoods. Um, another example is uh, blockchain analysis. Um, I will not go to all the, the details uh, that we see here, but um, in a nutshell, we examined uh, a money laundry attack where uh, a significant amount of uh, Bitcoin were stolen from a certain uh, exchange. And um, what's interesting in this problem is that it was uh, first handled by a traditional uh, approach. A traditional um, analysis, network analysis uh, approach was used by a team of uh, very skilled um, analysts who took several months in order to understand how this uh, attack actually took place. And, and this uh, appears in our uh, book from 2012, um, uh, Security and Privacy in Social Networks. And when we developed social physics, we wanted to see if we can use it in order to um, basically solve this problem automatically. And uh, you can read what we've done in our uh, 2018 book, where we have used this uh, approach in order to uncover a significant part of the money laundry network that was used for this specific attack automatically. Um, and maybe let me conclude by what is probably the most exciting aspect of, uh, of, of scalable AI and federated learning, which is the ability of governments to collaborate with NGOs, with academic researchers. Um, and this is very difficult and many times completely impossible to achieve without the ability to uh, uh, collaborate while um, keeping the data and the questions undisclosed. Um, so we, this, we presented this uh, in uh, uh, Davos, in the World Economic Forum, uh, a couple of years ago, where we also present uh, almost every year. Uh, and this is called AI for Good, where we uh, showed how social physics can be used in order to uh, allow, allow governments uh, to um, give access without disclosing any data that they possess to uh, researchers that usually don't have access to data, but they have uh, very interesting questions that uh, they want to, to answer. Um, so I hope this talk was interesting and um, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.